Lifeliners, today we'll continue on with part two in unlocking the manifold fulfillment of Christ. So let us review back what we have seen last week. Last week we have seen in the book of Matthew and Mark where we see Jesus as a lion, as the king, and also Jesus as the ox, as a suffering servant. So today we'll continue on with the book of Luke and also the book of John. So let us start with the book of Luke. The book of Luke was written by Luke himself. Luke is a non-Jew who is also a physician or a doctor. So he was very detailed in writing the accounts of Jesus' story. So let us start with what was the aim of Luke wanting to write this book. So in Luke 1 verse 3 to 4, it says, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus means the lover of God, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. And after telling us the aim of why he wants to write an orderly account, from a non-Jew perspective who is very well versed with the Old Testament, writing to another non-Jew to know what is the Old Testament all about and Christ coming to fulfill all of the Old Testament. And he starts off with Luke 1 verse 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. Why does he need to say that it was from the division of Abijah? Because the Abijah was the eighth division from the Aaronic household. And why is this so important? Because both of them are going to conceive a son named John. John the Baptist who will come to prepare the way for Jesus Christ, who will show men the light of the world, the light who is the Son of God. And when they had that child, John the Baptist, Zechariah praised God with this in Luke 1 verse 76 to 79. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercies of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Here is telling us that John the Baptist is to go before Jesus, to prepare the way, to ask them to repent and to be baptized, the baptism of repentance. And then Christ came to be baptized by John the Baptist in order that all men's sin can be passed unto the body of Jesus Christ who came as a man to take all our sins. And thereafter, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Luke 3 verse 23 to 38, it says, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. Why does Luke put this into account, the 30 years of age? Because the high priest needs to be in the age of 30 to be able to serve in his priestly duties. In verse 38, it says, The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, and the son of Adam, which is the beginning of all mankind. And in the end, it says, the son of God as well. So God, Jesus Christ, was fully God and fully man. And in the book of Luke, the main text that Luke wants to portray who Jesus is and what did Jesus come to do, his ministry is in Luke 4 verse 18 to 19. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, the anointed one, the Messiah, to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity, 
to proclaim the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the free favours of God profusely abound. So here we can see the first point is that Jesus Christ came to preach the good news to the poor. Who are the poor? The poor are those outsiders, the poor who are the outcasts, and the poor who humble themselves to receive Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Jesus Christ as the Son of Man as well, who came to save the world, who came to save them. And the next one we can see that to relieve the captive. In spiritual sense today, to relieve the captive, the captives are those who are bound by Satan, bound by the law, and been enslaved by the law and enslaved by the world. But today, through Jesus Christ, his baptism, death, and resurrection, we can be saved and be free from captivity of Satan, of the world, of the law, and of everything that is holding us back to serve his wonderful glory. And the third one you can see, he came to recover the sight of the blind. The blind are those who cannot see the kingdom of God, who cannot see the light is shining forth of Jesus Christ. But today in Christ, we can see the kingdom of God, the soon coming kingdom of God and the kingdom of God that is ready in us, in our hearts today. And next we can see that it came to deliver those who were oppressed, who were downtrodden. In today's sense, those who are oppressed, um, those who are mentally attacked. Jesus came to give you a sound mind a mind that can praise Him, a mind that can serve Him, a mind that can be profitable in the kingdom of God. And last but not least, He came to proclaim salvation. In Luke 19 verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus Christ comes to seek and to save the lost. Only those who are lost, only those who seek God, only those who seek who is Christ and what did he come to do can only be saved. And all of which, which was proclaimed in Luke 4 verse 18 to 19, Jesus walked the talk. He did everything physically at his time. But today, spiritually, he can do all things to set us free from bondage, to deliver us, to let us see what is the kingdom of God. Today, we are no longer blind. We are set free. We can see because Christ is living in us. So you may ask, why is it so important to acknowledge that Jesus Christ came as a man, as a son of man, to be born of a Virgin Mary? Because Christ needs to be our kinsman redeemer, to come down to this earth, to be born as a man, to take all our sins at his baptism, and eventually die for us. But before dying for us, he went through that three years also for us in order that he can relate to us. Imagine that Jesus was born as a carpenter's son. Joseph was a carpenter. And as a carpenter's son, he needed to do a carpentry work, which is also a hard work. He went through all of that up until the age of 30 before he went into the ministry doing the work and he also was abused and emotionally attacked and accused by the spiritual leaders back then, who constantly going against what he is trying to preach and what he is trying to do. So Christ can also relate to us when we are emotionally down, emotionally attacked, and we feel like nobody, nobody is there to love us, Christ knows what it feels. And in Hebrews 2 verse 17, it says, So it is evident that it was essential that he be made like his brethren in every aspect, in order that he might become a merciful, sympathetic and faithful high priest in the things related to God, to make atonement and propitiation for the people's sin. And it continues on in Hebrews 4 verse 15, it says, for we do not have a high priest 
who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability to the assault of temptation, but one who has been tempted in every aspect as we are, yet without sinning. Jesus Christ did not sin, but he came down as a man to take all our sins. And he was obedient to the Father up until even to pay his life for our sin. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And after Jesus' death, he was resurrected. And he told his disciples in Luke 24 verse 49, and says, And behold, I will send forth upon you what my Father has promised, but remain in the city Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. So the book of Luke ends with a promise of the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ, when he goes back home, he will send the Holy Spirit. So all of them are ought to wait for the Holy Spirit. And this is where it continues to the sequel of the book of Acts, where all of them indeed did receive the Holy Spirit and begin to speak forth in known languages that are different from different tongues that are from different nations and different countries, praising God's word and his works. So as a summary, the book of Luke was written to Theophilus, a lover of God, and Luke was a non-Jew writing to a non-Jew as well, and aiming to give an orderly account of Jesus' story in details, that we today may know the certainty of those things which are instructed. Luke gave us a basis of the Old Testament and that Christ have to come to fulfill all of it. And also Luke portrays Jesus as an actual person who came to seek and save the lost. And the main highlight of the book was focused on Luke 4 verse 18 to 19. He came to preach the good news, to set the poor free and to give freedom to the oppressed, the captives and the prisoners. By showing many miracles, this also continued on with his death and his resurrection. And in the end, in Luke 24 verse 49, he says he urged his disciples to stay in Jerusalem where he will send his promised Holy Spirit. This is how the book of Luke ends and it continues on with the book of Acts. Let us continue on with the book of John, which portrays Jesus as the figure of an eagle, which has a top view of everything. And in the book of John, it portrays Jesus Christ as a son of God, a divine figure. So in the book of John, the author addresses himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And many scholars have said that this was written by John, the son of Zebedee. So the aim of the book of John is written in John 20 verse 31, it says, But these are written, recorded in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of God, and that through believing and cleaving to and trusting and relying upon Him, you may have life, through in His name, through who He is. The book of John can be separated into two big blocks, with the book of science and the book of of glory, which is sandwiched in between a prologue and an epilogue. So how does the prologue start off? Which is said in John 1 verse 1 to 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So here it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you recall back how does Genesis start, Genesis 1 verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The author of the book of John is bringing us all the way back 
till in the beginning when God created the heaven and earth. And Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God, was in the work of creating the heaven and earth as well. And Jesus Christ indeed came as a man and he was the light of the world. Similarly, as all the other three Gospels has accounted Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist at River Jordan, so in the book of John, it was also written, but only in the book of John, it was specially mentioned in John 1 verse 29, that the next day John saw Jesus coming to him and said, Look, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So only in the book of John, we can see that John the Baptist is telling us that relating to us of the Old Testament where at the sacrificial system they need an unblemished lamb to take away all their sins that they have performed and dying for them for their sins so that they can be scot free. So John the Baptist at this moment is also telling us that this is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ indeed is that unblemished lamb who takes away all our sins at his baptism, even to the cross. This was correlated to the Old Testament at the sacrificial system. An unblemished lamb was needed to pass all the sins unto the unblemished lamb from the sinner so that in order that all their sins can be paid for. Similarly, John the Baptist is saying that Jesus Christ is that unblemished lamb today to take away all our sins, the whole world's sin, and to eventually die for our sin as well. And we'll continue on with John 3 verse 5 to 7, which we often hear in this church. The verse says, Jesus answered, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, unless a man is born of water and even the spirit, he cannot ever enter the kingdom of God. What is born of from the flesh is flesh, of the physical is physical, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, do not be surprised, astonished at my telling you. You must all be born anew from above. And now we'll be looking into the two main blocks of the book of John. So let us start off with the book of signs. The book of signs, there are seven signs here, where Jesus changed the water into wine, Jesus heals the royal official son, Jesus heals the paralytic at Bethsaida. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Some includes Jesus on walking on water in the seven signs. Some omitted it out. Continue on is Jesus heals the blind man from birth. And last but not least, Jesus raising Lazarus from his death. All of the signs which was recorded each corresponds to the seven I am that was recorded especially and uniquely in the book of John. I am speaks about that Jesus is affirming himself that he is indeed God came down as man. So in the first sign where Jesus changed the water into wine is related to the first I am. I am the true wine. The second which Jesus heals the royal official son, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth and the life. And when Jesus heals the paralytic at Bethsaida, it's related to Jesus saying, I am the door, enter through me. And when Jesus feeds the 5,000, it's related to Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. And when Jesus heals the blind man from birth, it's related to Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. And when Jesus rising Lazarus from his death, is related to, I am the resurrection and life. You may be wondering, what about the I am the good shepherd who would lay down his life for his sheep? That was related to Jesus' own death and his resurrection. But before we go into Jesus' death, let us see in the book of glory, what was Jesus telling his disciples? He focused more on his disciples he comforts them and give them the promise of the Holy Spirit, telling them more about what he's going to do after 
he has went back to his father. So in John 14 verse 26, it says, But the comforter, the counsellor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, stand by the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me and act on my behalf, he will teach you all things and he will cause you to recall, remind you of, bring to your remembrance everything that I have told you. And in verse 27 it says, Peace I leave with you, my own peace I now give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourself to be agitated and disturbed and do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. Jesus Christ not only gives us the promised Holy Spirit, but he also gives us peace. And John 15 verse 26, it continues, But when the Comforter, the Counselor, the Helper, the Advocate, Intercessor, Strengthener, Standby, which is the Holy Spirit who comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who comes proceeds from the Father, he himself will testify regarding me. And in John 16, verse 7 to 11, it also proclaims that Jesus Christ is going to send the Helper, which is the Holy Spirit, to the born-again believers of Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. However, I am telling you nothing but the truth. When I say it is profitable, good, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter, the counsellor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strengthener, standby, will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. And when he comes, he will convict and convince the world and bring demonstration to it about sin, about righteousness, uprightness of heart and right standing with God and about judgment. Verse 9, it says about sin because they do not believe in me. Trust in, rely on, adhere to me. About righteousness, uprightness of heart and right standing with God because I go to my Father and you will see me no longer. And about judgment because the ruler, the evil genius prince of this world, Satan, is judged and condemned and sentenced already is passed upon him. And in John 16 verse 13 to 14, it further encourages us that but when he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all the truth, the whole full truth. For he will not speak his own message on his own authority but he will tell whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. He will honour and glorify me because he will take off, receive, draw upon what is mine and will reveal, declare, disclose and transmit it to you. And like I've said just now, Jesus Christ not only promised to give the Holy Spirit when he goes back, he also promised with the Holy Spirit that you will also have peace. Peace that is undisturbed, even amidst tribulation, even amidst all distresses. In John 16 verse 33, it further tells us that I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world, you will have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer. Take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I've deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. Amen. And it continues on in John chapter 17, where Jesus prayed for himself, for his disciples, and for all the believers that we will be united, that because we are of Christ, we are united with Christ, we are not. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. So those who are in this world, but not of this world, will be hated like how those who do not believe in Jesus Christ hate Jesus Christ. So today, 
if we believe in Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, we are to proclaim this gospel truth even though in midst of tribulation, in midst of hardship, but because Jesus has given us that mandate and Jesus has given us that courage to go forward to preach the word of God. He is our strength. He is our protector because the Holy Spirit resides in us who is our advocate, our comforter. In everything that we do, we rely on the Holy Spirit. And the book of John ended with John 21 verse 25. It says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did. If they should be all recorded one by one in detail, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain, have room for the books that would be written. So as a summary for the book of John, it is written by the author who addresses himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. This book is separated into two main blocks, which is sandwiched in between by a prologue and an epilogue. It aims that through the signs and miracles recorded, that all may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And through believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, they will have eternal life. And it starts off by setting the pace that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came from above, where we have seen that Jesus is the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And this was separated into the Book of Signs, which was correlated with the seven I am, which affirms himself, Jesus Christ, as God. And the second half of the book comprises Jesus' compassion towards his disciple and revealed to them many things, such as the promise of the Holy Spirit that will be given to them once Jesus has gone back to his Father. And in chapter 17, Jesus prayed for himself, his disciples, and all believers. Thereafter, it was followed by his death and resurrection. And this ends with Jesus visiting his disciples and restoring Peter, and Jesus also promised of his second coming. Before we continue on in comparison or in summary of all the four Gospels that we have seen, let us see the baptism of Jesus that was covered in all four Gospels. So all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, covers that John the Baptist came to prepare the way. John the Baptist came to announce the baptism of repentance, to repent and be baptized. Repent means change your ways, change your view of how are you to be saved. Nothing you can do to be saved. There is nothing that we can work for to be saved but only by believing in Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. And in the four Gospels, what was highlighted in the book of Matthew was in Matthew 3 verse 15, it says, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us, John the Baptist and Jesus, to fulfill all righteousness. And it was also highlighted in John 1 verse 29, it says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So in both of this account, in the book of Matthew and in the book of John, it is written that it needs John the Baptist and Jesus to fulfill all righteousness. And John the Baptist is telling us that Jesus Christ is the unblemished Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. This was all recorded in all four Gospels, that when Jesus was baptized, when he went into the water and he came out of the water, immediately heaven opened and a dove recites on Jesus. And a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. This is the Son of God, whom I am well pleased. And let us move on to see, as a summary in the four Gospels that I have shared last week and today, in the book of Matthew, which speaks about the figure of a lion, speaks about Jesus is the king. And in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, we saw that Jesus gave the great commission to his disciples, that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
So go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Amen. And the book of Matthew ended with the resurrection of Jesus. Moving forward to the second book, where we have seen Mark as a figure as an ox, Jesus Christ came as a suffering servant. In Mark 10 verse 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And in the book of Mark, we saw that Jesus Christ came to serve. To serve who? To serve the born-again elects who believe in Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. And Jesus Christ himself came to serve us so that in order we can also serve through the service that Christ has given to us, we can serve others as well. To, in order for others to be able to know this beautiful gospel as well. And the book of Mark ends with the ascension of Jesus Christ. And the third one we saw was the book of Luke, which is speaking about Jesus as the Son of Man. He came as a Kingsman Redeemer. In Luke 19 verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And we have seen all of it, and it ends with the promised Holy Spirit that comes to be our advocator, our comforter, and our helper. And the last gospel that we saw was a unique one, which was written by the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is the book of John, which represents Jesus as a figure of an eagle. Jesus was said to be the Son of God. In John 20 verse 31, it says, But these are written, the signs are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And the book of John ends with the second coming of Jesus Christ. After learning all four Gospels, hasn't this ring a bell to you that is all related to the seven pillars? That in Proverbs 9 verse 1, it says, Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. So the seven pillars that we believe in is Jesus' birth, Jesus' baptism, Jesus' death, Jesus' burial, Jesus' resurrection, Jesus' ascension, and his second coming. All of which, which was covered in all four Gospels, in every unique way that the Gospel writers has written, in order that today we can believe that Jesus came for us, Jesus came as a king, Jesus came as a suffering servant, Jesus came as a man, and Jesus came as the Son of God. In order that today, in all faces, we can see that Jesus Christ came to relate to us. Jesus Christ came for us that we can reign with him. Jesus Christ came so that today we can rejoice in Him and embrace Him to walk with us daily. All of this also relates to our team this year, Reign with Christ, where we can see that the first quarter is elect. So Jesus Christ came as a king. In order that we believe in Him, we can reign with Christ. He's establishing that it's only through his baptism, death, and resurrection we can be in elect, a selected one, set apart one. And the second quarter we can see emulate, where Jesus Christ came as a servant, a suffering servant, in order that today, because he came to serve, we too can serve others by Christ serving us first, so that we can emulate him in order to proclaim this gospel of God's righteousness. And the third one is endure, where Jesus Christ as a man, he endured so many things. And today, he is able to relate to us in our pain, in our suffering, in our emotional breakdowns. He's able to relate to us as a man because he went through all of it. So today, with Jesus indwelling in us, we can meditate, mature, and mentor others in order to endure, to move on, to press on for this precious faith. 
And the fourth one is the face of an eagle. Today, we are able to reign with Christ in the divinity of Christ. Today, Christ is in us. Hence, the divine God, the Holy Trinity, is indwelling in us as well in order that we can enjoy the manifold wisdom of God, the manifold knowledge of God, the manifold blessings of God, and the manifold mercies of God, and the manifold grace of God is upon His elects today. And we will also further see the manifestation and the magnifying glory of God that shines forth in every single one of us elect today. So I hope all the four Gospels that we have learned have blessed you as how it has blessed me.